much. I want to thank uh, I want to thank Ernie for such a nice uh, introduction, and it's so nice to see so many people uh, out uh, this morning. And uh, yes, there is another George University in the District of Columbia. Uh, George Washington is the one I graduated from. Of course, is the one that most people talk about. <laughs> and we have the dean uh, with us this morning. I appreciate the uh, the analogy of RG3. We just hope Victor knows when to run out of bounds. Uh, <laughs> um, I, uh, again, appreciate the leadership of uh, DCBIA uh, here in the District of Columbia. They've been a wonderful partner. In fact, I was there just a matter of uh, a week or two ago uh, to talk about the One City Action Plan. And uh, what we're trying to do, we don't have a We'd like to think that we don't have a separate, a, a set, a set of separate and dis, disparate uh, documents or plans in the District of Columbia. If you go to the One City Action Plan, uh, you will see uh, a reference to this plan, so that these uh, efforts kind of flow uh, from one another, and we hope they will have enduring value uh, for the next uh, number of years here in the District of Columbia, and that they have a sufficient uh, framework that. In essence, what we can do is build upon them and continue to contemporize uh, these documents so that we, we all are essentially moving uh, in the same direction. I think many of you know that for some time uh, I've talked about uh, the district's need for a transformative uh, economic development strategy that can guide investment and uh, create new job opportunities for our residents uh, here in the city. You know, and to some extent, we started that almost from the time we got here. Uh, unemployment was 11.2% uh, when we arrived, and we established a number of things, including the One City, uh, One Hire program. And today, even though we continue to some extent uh, in the midst of a uh, recession and uh, could be cast back in if we happen to fall off the, vis the, uh, the, uh, the fiscal cliff, um, we really have brought down unemployment significantly uh, here in the city. Uh, we were at 11.2%. Uh, today, we are at 8.7%, uh, a drop of 2.5%, which is huge, especially for a city as complicated uh, as the District of Columbia is, and we hope that we will continue to move in that uh, direction. Uh, today, we are pleased to talk about the five-year economic development uh, strategy uh, for the city. And we believe it's the city's first ever uh, sector-driven uh, strategic roadmap for uh, economic development. I want to acknowledge the presence, too, of somebody who's made a, a mighty contribution over the years to economic development here in the city uh, as a longtime council member uh, re working on behalf of uh, her city. Uh, and that, of course, is, uh, I'll call her council member, Charlene Drew Jarvis. acknowledging her uh, because I didn't and so I'm going to be in time out this evening. <laughs> <laughs> even, though, even though you made that George faux pas, I'm still with you, Ernie. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, I know you, you uh, heard the reference to the One City uh, Action Plan and if you go to goal two, which I know you'll rush right home and do that, uh, you will see a reference to uh, a promise we made there and that is uh, preparing uh, residents for uh, the new economy uh, here in the District of Columbia, which is exactly what this plan uh, is intended uh, to do. Uh, of course, we unveiled it yesterday at the press briefing. Some of you were there. Uh, and we're delighted to have this opportunity today, today to further explain uh, where it is we're trying to go. Uh, when we kicked this off back in June, uh, we did it at the Carnegie Library. and. Uh, Certainly wasn't the first time that some effort like this has been kicked off uh, in the city. And those who've been around a long time probably were properly uh, skeptical about where uh, this was likely to go and what it was likely uh, to produce. Uh, but when we kicked it off, we had four universities with us. Uh, George uh, Washington University, which of course is my alma mater, Georgetown University, Howard, and American Universities. And we had with us uh, along the way the deans of the business schools. Uh, we have Dean Guthrie uh, here with us today who really has been fantastic. And Dean, I want to thank you. I know we'll hear from you, but I want to thank you for being such a great partner 
uh, and President Knapp of George Washington University and President DeJoya and the other presidents who uh, really given everything they could <clears throat> to help us get to this day. Uh, but each of those deans said, we're going to help. We're going to provide um, MBA students. So we had 16 MBA students in addition to the deans uh, working with us uh, in order to be able to make this happen. So I want to thank them uh, for the work they did. And I'd ask you to give a big hand to our business schools and our universities who helped out so much. Uh, we also had a, a strategy advisory group, and of course we had DEMPED. Uh, we really worked hard to, I won't say reform DEMPED, but really to recognize and crystallize and make more, make more well-defined, if you will, uh, the role uh, of, the, of the deputy mayor for planning and economic development uh, in the city. And some of the things in this plan don't even articulate what we've tried to do uh, in that arena, arena. Like just a week ago, uh, this past Friday, uh, we transmitted legislation that we think will substantially reform our uh, small and local business development uh, component here in the District of Columbia and will help to define what the role of our small businesses will be uh, in the growth uh, of that city. Uh, our planning component is very involved uh, in the effort to continue to define what the city will look like uh, in the future. So. When you look at DEMPED today, you'll probably see uh, a different uh, DEMPED. Who would have ever thought that the uh, deputy mayor would be Robert Griffin III uh, leading uh, DEMPED? <laughs> uh, in any event, uh, we have tried to make this a collaborative effort. We had 100, more than 180 stakeholders uh, who were interviewed uh, in this process. They included people from the federal government, contractors, those engaged in professional services, uh, higher education, uh, health care, hospitality, technology, retail and real estate, and of course construction, all of which are areas that we believe are, have growth potential uh, for uh, the uh, city. Um, we think that our goals are ambitious, but we also think that they are achievable. Uh, when you look at two of the, I would call them the headlines, one, one is to uh, create 100,000 new jobs in the District of Columbia in the next five years and generate a uh, a billion dollars in additional tax revenue. And as I said yesterday, people probably saying, you know, whatever you were smoking before you came in here, you probably better get off of that. Uh, but, but frankly, if you start to analyze those, those goals, you really begin to see how achievable, achievable they are. Uh, first of all, we have created in the last 22 uh, months, 23,000 jobs in the District of Columbia. So do, do the math, uh, figure it out. Take uh, 100,000 jobs uh, over 60 months and see what that comes out to be. That isn't markedly greater than what we are be beginning to do uh, now. 1,000 jobs a month, uh, to get to 100,000, that probably is what, about 1,500 uh, new jobs uh, a month, which is an eminently uh, achievable, it seems to me. And from that uh, will come uh, additional revenue, obviously, and a, and a big part of it is being able to keep revenue uh, here in the District of Columbia rather than seeing it leave. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that we'll talk about is retail leakage, uh, the money that's lost at the District of Columbia. Uh, we've estimated, the best estimates we have is that uh, annually uh, we lose about a billion dollars of uh, spending uh, to the surrounding area. And that's just one uh, area of potential for additional revenue uh, for the city. So think about what the city will look like in 2017 uh, when we have 100,000 new jobs, we have 100, we have a, a billion dollars of additional revenue. There's a lot we can do with that, <clears throat> and also that with it will come challenges that will have to be addressed in parallel uh, with this development. Uh, the infrastructure of the city will be significantly taxed uh, by all these new jobs and frankly by the new residents. We are gaining a thousand new residents uh, a month at this stage <clears throat> and there's no reason why that can't continue. Uh, but again, think about the tax, the taxing uh, effort uh, on our uh, water uh, systems, our roads, uh, our central in infrastructure here in the District of Columbia. In any event, and you'll hear more detail about it, we believe there are six bold visions uh, that will drive uh, this plan. First of all, uh, establishing the most business-friendly economy in the nation. And what that means is stripping away what many of you have experienced, and that is uh, 
the regulatory strangulation uh, in the District of Columbia. I don't know how else to put it. I, I hope that that's descriptive. Uh, but there are people who have had brilliant ideas and have set out to do them. And uh, we, like many places, have figured out how to, how to, how to whip the ambition out of you uh, by creating structures that are almost impossible to get through. So we already have established a business regulation task force. We have a person who will be uh, staffing that. Uh, someone who's worked uh, with you uh, in the past, um, and that will be a, a huge piece of this. Uh, secondly, creating the largest technology center on the East Coast. Some of you undoubtedly have seen that um, we are uh, looking to bring uh, Sidlam to the city, it's a, an, an international firm, SmartBIM, and then, of course, again, as I like to call them, this you know, a small firm from Redmond, Washington called Microsoft. Uh, that we'd like to see have a, 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 uh, an increased presence here in the District of Columbia um, and, frankly, on the St. E's uh, campus. Can you imagine Microsoft in, in Ward 8? <laughs> that, that, that really is kind of unheard of. And I think the day will come when people will say, well, what's the big deal? Of course Microsoft is in Ward 8, uh, but not this day. Um, I talked about ending uh, retail leakage. Uh, we'd also like to become the nation's destination of choice, that people want to come here because it is a place uh, to visit. Uh, it is a place to move to, as we talked about, the number of people uh, coming here. Fifth, creating the best uh, possible global medical center, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about in just a second, and then becoming the top North American destination uh, for foreign investors, uh, businesses, uh, and uh, tourists. There are 52 initiatives that will help to flesh out uh, these uh, six goals, and they are contained. I guess everybody got a copy of the, uh, did you get a copy of the, uh, the entire plan? I, I see it in front of you. Um, you have exactly 24 hours to read it. <laughs> uh, and of course, there's an executive summary, which we do hope you read that. Uh, that's probably is more likely to be read than the other document. Um, now, among those 52 initiatives, some of the things that we hope to do is to secure commitments from um, major hotels, uh, major hotel groups, retailers, and construction companies uh, to collaborate with our workforce intermediary. Our workforce intermediary is something that we've created in the last uh, 12 months, and it is designed to really facilitate training people for jobs that will exist in the city. Again, some of this stuff on its face is pretty simple, but it just kind of like never fully gets done. Uh, so we're trying to connect the dots. Uh, the workforce intermediary will focus on two areas uh, initially. Uh, people ask me about whether we were creating jobs that really will not address the needs of people who may have uh, limited areas of education. But the workforce intermediary will address two areas initially, hospitality and construction. And we hope that uh, our uh, major uh, employers in the District of Columbia will work with us so that we can train people through the workforce intermediary for those jobs that do exist and will increasingly be created uh, here in the District of Columbia. Secondly, uh, again, the medical uh, center we'd like to create, we'd like to, to establish the Macmillan uh, tract, which is right at Michigan Avenue uh, and North Capitol Street, a long uh, discussed uh, tract of land in the District of Columbia but one that uh, we want to really move forward with uh, now to develop. And think about what you have there. You have thousands of jobs in the immediate uh, area. You have the uh, Veterans Hospital, you have the Rehab Hospital, you have the Children's Hospital, and you have the Washington Hospital Center, all within a matter of feet uh, of that tract. So why shouldn't we create a place there where people will be trained uh, for, for the jobs that already exist and increasingly will be uh, developed? Uh, again, bringing technology firms um, uh, to uh, St. Elizabeth's Hospital. We have 180 acres of land uh, there. Uh, we believe we've already uh, commenced the planning for a food pavilion across the street is the uh, Coast Guard. They will open next year. There will be 4,400 jobs and people that will be coming there. And frankly, this is one of those where, to use a sports metaphor, I think this is ours to lose, not ours to even to, to have to work hard to win. 4,400 people who either can stay on that campus and create an enclave there, or 4,400 people who can help to be a catalyst for uh, the community 
uh, that exist in the Martin Luther King, Good Hope Road, Alabama Avenue uh, area. Um, we want to work harder to bring more technology talent to the city. Uh, we will be participating increasingly in the South by Southwest Festival. Any of you heard of that? A few people, huh? Well, hopefully in a couple of years, everybody uh, will have heard of it, just like you've heard of the shopping center uh, convention. But it really is essentially the same thing. And a great opportunity for us is to establish a presence uh, in that arena, as we know that's an opportunity to, uh, to grow. And then establishing a culinary uh, incubator uh, to help aspiring chefs uh, find the kitchen space they need to develop their skills and become entrepreneurs in some instances. Again, um, while you know, I'm sure a number of chefs have graduate degrees, I don't think it takes a graduate degree to become a chef. And you see uh, this industry developing quickly in the District of Columbia, and we need to take full uh, advantage of it. Uh, yesterday, we had a great illustration of what can happen, and that is we were at the Kennedy Recreation Center, and I wanted to make sure that people understood we weren't at the Recreation Center because we wanted people to see a recreation center. What we wanted them to see was what was going on out the window, and that is the uh, O Street Market uh, project, uh, which we were able to get started uh, once we got here. That project has now created 413 construction jobs and will create 400 permanent jobs with the giant that's coming there, with the hotel that's coming there, and the other retail that will be a part uh, of that development. And we think is a wonderful illustration of the uh, quality services that will be brought there, as well as the jobs. It also, I think, is an illustration, too, of one of the other goals, and that is to bring more international investment uh, to the city. We went to China uh, in June. And again, I want to thank Dean Guthrie because he certainly was somebody who was a, a huge supporter uh, and proponent uh, of us doing that. We spent the week, and I really think it was just phenomenally uh, successful. And there ought to be in the city at least one trade mission uh, a year uh, where we go to help sell the city. Uh, one of the things that we came back with was for the O Street Market. We finalized the deal there with the EB-5 program. How many people are familiar with the EB-5 program? That's great. Well, there's more that we can do uh, with that. Uh, the uh, deal was closed with an investment of $40 million. There were 80 investors investing $500,000 through the EB-5 program, which in some respects is fairly simple. If you'll invest uh, at least $500,000 and can guarantee there will be 10 jobs uh, created as a result of that investment, it will allow you to get a visa uh, to the United States. Uh, so I think it's not only 40, but I think we're at 50 or 55 million dollars investment just in the O Street Market uh, project at that point, and will be an avenue for more. We we have uh, nurtured a relationship with Cutter. Uh, I met with the ambassador uh, last week to talk about additional projects, but Cutter has invested 800 million dollars in the Center City uh, project here in the District of Columbia. And, I got to tell you, man, uh, the, the construction is amazing. You go by there today, tomorrow you'll go by and you see, you know, perceptible differences in the construction that's taking place there. Um, and it's yet another example of what we can do uh, with international investment. So uh, one of the things that's important, uh, and I'll stop on this, and that is to be able to make sure we have a well-oiled, well-heeled, capable apparatus within the District of Columbia government to be able to get these things done. And we've spent a lot of hours talking about what DEMPED needs to look like. We already are investing additional resources. We're already bringing in additional professionals uh, to assist us with this. Uh, it's a relatively, it's like the light brigade. Uh, when you look at the number of people uh, who work there, we don't want them to have the same fate as the light brigade at the end of the day. <laughs> but um, it, is, it, is, it is a relatively small uh, group of people. And we are going to increase the resources, and we hope that you all will work with us to be able to accomplish that. Because sometimes what seem like good ideas, uh, when they get into other arenas where some approvals may be needed, they, they're not viewed necessarily as uh, the best ideas. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we're trying to tie resource requests to actual plans. So that if somebody says no, they're not just saying no to, I need you know a half a million dollars. What they're saying no to is, no, I don't think you all ought to do that. And there ought to be a demand then for why is it the city shouldn't be moving uh, in those directions. The last thing I'll say is we think technology is a, uh, is a huge 
uh, development area uh, for the city. And we, uh, we are excited about having gotten the Tech Sector Enhancement Act approved for the District of Columbia, which got rid of those arcane zones uh, where you could get incentives. Now we have one zone in the District of Columbia. It's uh, creatively called the District of Columbia uh, to be able to get technology incentives. But one piece of that that we lost, that was just, it was just hugely depressing. And that is, we wanted to become more competitive with Maryland and Virginia, because we've had essentially two kinds of technology firms in the District of Columbia. We've had those that got started and failed. We've had those that got started and moved. Now, if you start to do the math on that, you get a zero at the end. Let me just give you one example. When we were going through the, the work around the Technology Sector uh, Enhancement Act, we learned about a firm that started in the District of Columbia, started in the city. They moved to Virginia a number of years ago. They now have uh, 10,000 employees, and they're worth $12 billion lost to the District of Columbia. Why? Because it was a much more favorable economic climate outside of the District of Columbia than it was uh, here in the city. Maryland uh, has a capital gains tax of on, on technology firms of five and three quarters percent. Anybody know what the, the uh, technology capital gains tax is in Virginia? Anybody know? Nothing. It is zero. Zero. Anybody know what it is in the city? Nine, almost nine percent, which makes it not competitive for an investor who may be thinking about investing in that sector who says, no, nah, I don't think I'll invest. Well, I'll work with the people in Virginia because I can maximize, I can optimize the return on my dollar um, as a result of that. So we're going to come back after the Tax Revision Commission finishes its work. It's work. We don't know what they'll say. It depends on what they say it depends in terms of what we do uh, about this. But um, we had proposed 3 percent, which we thought was reasonable for the city. There is a great desire of people to be in the city, and I think having a 3% capital gains tax for earnings off of investments in uh, technology uh, enterprises will be very attractive for the people, uh, the people in the city. And frankly, we're getting virtually nothing now. And to me, 3% um, uh, you know, of something is certainly a lot better than 9% of nothing, which is exactly what we're getting. But the business community in this city is going to have to step up and become advocates for where it sees this city going. There are many advocates in this city. This city is replete with advocates. It has a PhD in advocacy. Uh, and, and frankly, the, B, the business, the retail, the construction, uh, technology communities are going to have to step up too. Because it's nice to come to these kind of meetings. It's nice to have these kind of discussions. It is wonderful to have a plan right here. But you know what? If we don't get the advocacy to support this direction, it'll be collecting dust, and five or six years from now, somebody will come along and say, why don't we develop a new economic development plan for the District of Columbia? And it will sound like it's new, and people will come to a meeting and listen to it, and then five years after that, somebody will say, let's develop an economic development plan for the District of Columbia. Let's get off of that cycle, ladies and gentlemen. We have a chance to move this forward. Let's get behind this. Let's continue to refine this. Let's, refine this. let's work with the people who are moving on the business front to be able to make this reality. And let's turn this five-year economic development plan into a path forward for the District of Columbia. Thank you all very much. Let me uh, invite the deputy mayor to, uh, to come up. Deputy mayor, do you want to do it here or? Okay, perfect. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, let me begin by saying that I, I'm, I'm greatly honored to be here today. I have, um, I, I tell the mayor all the time that I have never, ever had so much fun at work. I mean, I actually have a great time at work. I actually, one day, I don't know what I was thinking. I actually said, Mayor, you know what? If, if, if I wouldn't pay it, I'd still do this job. Well, that's not quite true. And I don't think my wife would approve of that. <laughs> but I really do, I, I do love this work. And it is, it is hard, it is difficult, it is complex. Um, a lot of times it's not fun. I've been called interesting names um, that I wouldn't repeat to my family or my grandchildren. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a tough job to have, but I've really never had more fun in my life. And it's because all of that comes out of a heart 
um, that the people have for the city. Um, and I first saw that when I met the mayor um, in January of 2011. And many of you have heard me say this before. It was his love for this city that made me want to work here. Okay, I, it, it, he, he has such a love for this city that I, I just frankly, I, it was hard to believe. I mean, I, he, he talked for like 15 minutes about the city. I'm sitting there going like, is this a mayor? I've worked with a lot of mayors. I've worked with a lot of great mayors. I, I work with Kurt, Kurt Schmoke in, in, in the city of, uh, of Baltimore. You know, I, I've worked with some great governors. I work with Governor Glenn Denning, um, you know, in the state of Maryland. I've worked with some great leaders. You know, Mayor Kell in the city of Long Beach. I've worked with some great mayors and great governors. But you know what? I've never worked with anyone that loved the place so much. He was born here. He was raised here. He got married here, raised his children here, developed his career here. And he is still here contributing to the city in ways that are greater each year. And I, and I tell you, when I went to his birthday party the other day, I watched people walk up to him and talk to him. And, and, and I, I could just see how much they admire him and um, how much they appreciate him. And I don't know if they could appreciate him more than I do. And I, I'm very thankful that he invited me to be his deputy mayor. And I just want to take a moment to recognize our great mayor, <laughs> Mayor Gray of the city of Washington, D.C. And I just want to take a moment also um, to really uh, thank uh, Charlene Drew Jarvis um, because um, she, early on, she kind of buttonholed me and pulled me real close um, in her kind and gracious way. And she said, Victor, there's some things you're not doing. And I went, uh-oh. <laughs> And she kind of went down this very clear list. Um, they all were related to workforce and education. Um, and I, I said, yeah, you're, you're right. I'm not doing that. And I had been on the job like 45 days. And I go, you know, I'm going to need just a little bit more than 45 days to undo something that took 45 years to create. So if you could just bear with me. And she's been very patient with me. And she now knows that we are serious about our commitments because we've moved forward on some of them. And I appreciate your patience. And, and I really want to beg the patience of, of, of a lot of you in this room because um, that's what we're going to need to get through this process. Um, I want to thank Ernie Jarvis for inviting us here to talk about this. This is not, um, you know, this is not, you know, the 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 the, the fun, great, you know, kind of, you know really cool topics that a lot of people talk about. Um, but this is the real work that needs to be done. Um, he realizes that. He gave us this platform, and, and I want to take advantage of it. And before we go any further into the program, I want to talk about what we want to happen when this is over. The mayor gave you a call to action. I want you to move on that action. Um, I received about 10 emails this morning, and I was responding to them before I got here. Actually, Ingrid, my executive assistant in the back, was, was calling me, asking me where I was. I was quietly across the way in the courtyard answering these emails, telling people, directing people to David Zipper and Lena Fang. These, please stand up. I want them to see you guys. These are the two people that are going to help create the working committees that are going to move these initiatives. I want, after this, I want you to give them your business card with the initiative that you're interested in working on specifically. I just want you to do that because that way they can contact you and get you to work because we're not gonna do this by ourselves. Oh no, this is not a city deal. No, this is our deal. This is the public sector, the private sector, the universities and the city working together. I'm gonna take a moment to um, also thank um, Deborah Salzberg, uh, Ratner Salzberg for her tremendous contribution to our affordable housing um, um, strategy that's going on right now in parallel to this. That's housing, this is economic development, so please don't ask any housing questions. But she has been a tremendous um, um, advocate, a tremendous supporter, and um, she, she really um, stepped up um, to be part of this panel um, by a, a personal request from me, and I deeply appreciate that. And um, I feel like her contribution, and I don't know if you guys have seen what she's doing in Capitol Ri Riverfront, but it's definitely visionary. I don't know what, if you've seen what they've done at, at Biotech Park in Baltimore, it's visionary. I don't know if you've seen what they've done in, 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 in Boston, um, and actually in Cambridge, uh, next to my alma mater, MIT. It's, it's phenomenal. But that's the kind of, of visionary leader that we have, not just here, but in this audience. And I want to recognize you for your tremendous contribution to the city. And I'm just going to take a minute to thank Dean Guthrie. I don't see any of the other deans in the room, but the universities played a tremendous part in this process. They have been powerful in it. And by that, I mean, they didn't just want to like help write a study, do some analytics, you know, give us some MBAs. They actually want to change the city. Dean Guthrie told me, Victor, I want to make a difference. I want my business school to make a difference. China happened 
because he wanted his business school to make a difference. This study is done because he wanted his business school to make a difference. Uh, Dean Thomas yesterday from Georgetown, Georgetown, actually said the same thing. He wants to make a difference. Um, Howard University, American University, they all want to make a difference. We have great partners, but we have to pull them um, to the place on the table where they can contribute the most. And, and that's what he's done. And I want to thank Dean Guthrie for his great work and his, the contribution of his team. Are there any MBAs in here? In the, the, the participants, please stand up. The, the, the ones that participated in the study, none? none. They, were, they were here yesterday. I got to tell you something, them, Christine, and other people from GW just did an amazing job on this. Um, any American University, Howard University, I guess, I guess they're all at school taking classes, <laughs> trying to finish that MBA now. Uh, but I really do appreciate the work they've contributed, and you're going to see um, some of their analytics in this. Um, I wanna, the, the last thing I want to say before I bring uh, Dean Guthrie up to fall, go through these four major goals, he's going to go through four slides, and then we're going to go to Q&A. Um, what I want to do is I want to thank my staff. I want to thank every one of my staff, um, not just the ones that worked on this economic development strategy, but those that picked up the slack for us when we pulled off of projects and did this. The mayor is, is committed to, to do additional investment. We'll talk about that during the Q&A. The mayor is committed to provide us additional human resource. But in the meantime, what we have been doing is what I call the SWAT approach. And I mean S-W-A-T, not S-W-O-T. Um, and we have just, we just grab people to do stuff. I mean, I remember one day I felt so sorry for Janice Posey. Is Janice Posey here? She runs our Eds and Meds group. We just snatched her and threw her in the middle of something. She didn't know what was going on. But you know what? Everyone contributed. And if, my, if, if any of my staff are here, could you please stand up so you can be recognized? Stand up. I said, stand up. I said, stand up. There we go. And as you can see, there are only four in the room because the rest are at home working. <laughs> and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dean Guthrie to walk through these four slides, and then we'll go to Q&A. Thank you. Um, I just want to, as we start this, um, just start by saying I want to, I, I appreciate so much having been able to be involved in this process. As, as Victor said, when I took over as Dean of the Business School over a little, uh, a little over two years ago, I really had a dream about using that platform not just to create good students that thought about the intersection of business and society, but actually to build a presence of citizenship of my institution within within this, uh, this great city. Um, and, you know, I think that, that we be, were given that opportunity, and for me it was just, uh, I, I couldn't be more thankful. So uh, the, the thanks goes both ways. Um, just as a, a way of walking through these points that, that, um, are, that the Deputy Mayor has put up here, uh, I'd like to take the narrative back a little bit because um, it tells a little bit about how this evolved and what kind of work actually went into it. And I'm going to start with the, with the bottom point because um, it really is an important thing, not just for the universities to play a role, but as the deputy mayor and the mayor said, uh, it's important that every institution within this community really come together to help, help this plan come to fruition. And the, the, the mayor often says that this plan was kicked off in, in June, but I actually think for me, this plan was kicked off two years ago in December of 2010, before the mayor was inaugurated. Steve, President Knapp, uh, and I attended a... a uh, one a symposium like this, uh, and as an academic, I often get a little bit uh, cynical about things like this because it seems like you have lots of time talking and then what action actually comes out of them. And the mayor threw down a challenge then, before he was even inaugurated, and he said, we have to come together as institutions and really think about how we are going to move this forward. And I remember him talking about uh, uh, an economic development plan then, uh, and job creation that was really a critical piece. And I sat there thinking, what is my institution going to do about this? How can we actually contribute? I don't know how we can contribute, uh, but we're going to do our best. And Steve Knapp and I committed at that point to channeling university resources to be the best citizens that we could be in part of this process. Now, over the course of the next year, I got closer and really became a friend uh, of the deputy mayor. And I think initially I was a, sort of a, a, an annoying gnat buzzing in his ear saying, what, what can I do? What can I do? Let me help. Uh, but eventually, uh, he started to, to, to warm up to the idea of, of actually really channeling some of the things that we can do. We spent some time in China together. 
uh, and introduced him to some of the folks I know there. But this really began when he asked us as the business school to start thinking about an economic impact model that would really take a deep look at how you assess the, the impact of things, not just in terms of numbers of jobs created, but in terms of the multipliers that happen when you do things like job creation in a given area. So to give you a couple of examples, um, you know, the mayor talked about the 800 jobs that are going to be created in the O Street market. Uh, what, you're, what we're interested, though, is not just in the 800 jobs that are created, but the net present value of those jobs five years out. And that has, is based on multiplier effects that happen through the amount of money that's spent within the city. So those people that will shop in that supermarket that are, that, that's going to be at the bottom of that, that uh, construction site. Um, those things then have a, the, the beautiful recurring cyclical effect of consumption, which breeds to healthier economic development, which breeds to more consumption. And then you have a much healthier process. Those things are, there's a whole science in this. Uh, of economic development, and it's not easy to get the model perfect, but the deputy mayor charged us with trying to help figure out how we could think about those issues in a much more complex way. So we could in some ways help to analytically depoliticize resource allocation and just really try to analyze exactly what would, what would happen in a given set of is issues. So the universities came together uh, to really try to think about that. Uh, and then at some point when we were in that process, the deputy mayor said, look, we have some resources for an economic development plan. Um, we don't have enough resources to, to go to a, a, a high-end private consulting firm, but is there a way that the business schools could help with this? And we thought about it, uh, and he and I came up with a strategy that was really about how do we channel coursework into student experience which would then lead to in, an engagement with the, the private sector in these issues. And so that's really what we tried to design. And so that takes us back to about uh, March, when we really started these students uh, in coursework that really trained them in how to do this and trained them in what the interview protocols would be and trained them in how to actually uh, engage with the private sector. And so what, by the time we kicked off in June, uh, because, you know, here, June to here might seem like a very short process. Uh, we actually already had the students really up and running and ready to engage the private, private sector community, uh, which they did then over the next, um, over, over the next uh, about 90 days. Um, and then uh, gathered the data, siphoned the data out to, uh, into, into kind of key buckets, um, and then really engaged with, with uh, the deputy mayor's staff to figure out exactly how to put those things uh, th into the vision that, that the mayor had originally laid out. Uh, and then this led to the development, uh, the economic development priorities that you see in front of you today. So for me, it's been just an incredibly enriching experience. It's been an exciting experience. It's been an exciting experience for the students. Uh, many of those students now are, are uh, already getting placed in consulting jobs for the future because they have had an experience that was truly a great educational experience. And it's been just a wonderful thing to be a part of. One of the things that I should just mention about this, of course, though, is that if you think about strategic planning, you have to think about how you make decisions about resource allocation and how to, how to move forward. Uh, and one of the things that we obviously noticed very early on is that there is a very um, heavy reliance on a couple of core sectors um, within this economy. Now, that's not a terrible thing because these core sectors you can build an economy around, but it's not a very diversified strategy. Uh, and so what we were charged with doing was taking seven sectors, not these core three that, that are the largest areas of employment, and really trying to think, try to think about how the city would develop and then sort of plug those development ideas through the economic impact modeling. Um, you can see that we spent time in each of these sectors. So the, the, mo the, the approach to doing this was a mixture of qualitative and quantitative work. And what I mean by that is the qualitative work is really important in this because if you're going to engage the private sector, you have to sit down with people and talk to them face to face and really think about what their issues are, what their needs are, what their experiences are on the ground, uh, and then extract from those ideas that come out an economic modeling process that really kind of grinds it through um, the, the, the models to figure out what the, the net impact would be. We, the students interviewed 185 people uh, within this sector. There were many more interviews that happened behind the scenes that were sort of uh, in, engaged with the community. Uh, but these were sort of the official interviews that took place. I'm sure some of the people in this room uh, sat down with the students. And I want to thank everybody who did that, because it just, uh, your time is valuable. And it, but these were really the things that guided this process. Um, and then through that, we, act, we looked very closely at how these things would all come out to create 100,000 new jobs and a billion dollars of recurring tax revenue. Um, and so that was a, a, a 
really, I, I think, great opportunity to really think about what it was that was going to take this city forward and make the, the, the mayor's vision live. And so uh, I'll stop right there and uh, turn it back over to you, Ernie. And, uh, thank you, Dean. Thank you. Uh, we're going to have just a Q&A uh, period here, and I'm going to start off by asking the mayor. Uh, mayor, in your comments, you, you talked about this is an, an ambitious plan. And so if you could talk a little bit about the resources needed to execute this plan. And beginning day one, what are the priorities of some of these sectors? Uh, the dean just went through a number of them and talked about diversity uh, in the sectors. Um, we know as a community at DCBIA that the construction and real estate add to about 35% of the total revenues for the city. So I guess resources required and uh, priorities, sector priorities, day one. Well, we, we really, I don't, I don't want to uh, precisely try to quantify what we need to do in the, in the uh, gym pad, but I think at the end of the day, to be able to effectuate this, we're probably going to need to double the number of uh, resources that we have uh, committed in gym pad at this stage. And we, we've been through a couple of budget cycles now. And uh, we went through one where there was an effort even to cut out resources. And you, you know, like you go. Uh, so l let me just use you know something that's easily retained, and that is that we double the number of resources devoted to uh, DEMPAD. How many staff do we have now, Victor? Probably about uh, I don't know, 30, 40. D dedicated to development, yeah, about 30. Yeah. So uh, imagine saying that we'd add 30 staff to generate 100,000 jobs and a billion dollars of additional revenue. It seems like a very meager sum to me to invest. And that's why there has to be a context uh, to this. So uh, at, at, at a minimum, and we're, we're already looking at, we're, we're moving things around now. Uh, we've had a lengthy discussion about adding 10 uh, additional people uh, at this stage to help get this uh, started. Um, now, in terms of the sectors, you saw the sectors that uh, we, we uh, talked about those. Uh, a, a huge part of this is to try to be able to remove, to move our reliance on the federal government, uh, broaden that to some extent. We have been a federal city uh, for a very long time, and uh, a lot of what this will do is, is to expand the, uh, the sectors that, uh, that exist, but also develop one that barely exists uh, at this stage, and that is um, the technology uh, sector. Uh, and that's going to require, frankly, in David's area, it's going to require uh, the ability to recruit firms, to bring firms uh, to the District of Columbia. And I want to underscore another a point I made earlier, Ernie, and that is if we don't get the support of those who are, I would say, the beneficiaries who are interested in this, this will never realize its full potential. The business community, and I'm using that in a broad sense, uh, generic sense, has got, to, has got to become more assertive and more aggressive uh, in this city. It can't just meet and talk about what we should do and then hope that somebody else uh, does it. It's got to become as assertive. And I, I come from a human services background. And there were people who you know, are incredibly uh, assertive advocates uh, in that arena who have nothing to work with other than their own commitment. Uh, people who, when you go back and look at some of the organizations, they might have five people uh, who work there. But they are vocal, they are visible, mm -hmm. they are present, mm -hmm. they are engaged, mm -hmm. and they are active in their hearts in supporting what they believe is best for their particular movement. This community here is, is, is huge, and it's got to be able to do the same thing. If we are left to have to do this simply as an entity of government or the government, it will never realize its full potential. Uh, and technology is a good example. I would ask you to go back and say, when the Technology Sector Enhancement Act was on the table, what did I do in order to move it? How many people even knew it was going on? Those who knew what was going on, did you get up and do anything? I, I, I know who went and saw council members and talked to them about that. And there, were, there was a handful of people. And not, at, the risk of being, uh, at the risk of being offensive, those who did it were easily ignored because it was such a small handful of people who stood up. And then at the end of the day, people go, mm, 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 isn't that terrible, boy. Well, you know what? That, that day has to be over. Because if it's not over, we'll be doing, we'll be doing a lot of hand-wringing uh, in the future. So that has to be one of the resources too, Ernie. 
It has, there has to be a resource in the community. One of the things I'm especially pleased with is the fact that the university community has stepped up. We've often talked about the university community being a resource to the city. Here is a tangible example of the university community being a resource. And there is much more that can be done and I think will be done. But this community sitting out in front of me to my left, straight on and to my right, is also a tremendous resource, not just for the city, but for yourselves as well. So I ask you to do it, I beg you to do it, because if you do it, the city will be a different place. It will, it will frankly be able to effectuate, it will actualize the things that we've talked about today and are uh, set forth in those documents. You know, we even have, have, have worked to try to figure out, you know, where these 100,000 jobs would be. Half of them would probably be in real estate uh, and construction. Uh, another 20,000, one-fifth of them would come from the tech sector. But that will not happen unless we have an environment within which people want to be able to have their firms in this city, and frankly, people will want to come to this city and work in the technology sector. We, have, we, we, we were able to, and I'll stop after this, but we, we, uh, we have Fortify. You all, anybody familiar with Fortify? Fortify moved to the city. We worked to, to create some incentives for them to move to the city last January. Um, they, moved, they, were gonna, they were in Virginia. They were going to move closer in into Virginia. And we competed to bring them in the city. They incubate technology firms. We went to see them about, I guess, a month and a half, two months ago. And one firm that is starting to grow there, they had, um, I think they had, I don't know, six to ten employees at that stage. They are on K Street. They're probably about uh, five minutes from here. Every person working for that incubator lives in the District of Columbia. Now, if they had gone to Virginia or stayed in Virginia, guess where those people probably would have lived who were working for that incubator? In Virginia. It is not rocket science. It is not nuclear physics, ladies and gentlemen. It is commitment, and everybody kind of helped moving in the same direction. So if I sound like I'm engaging in exhortation, that is exactly what I am doing, okay? I have, been, I have worked in the advocacy community and human services. I have seen the light brigade change things in ways that, that were unimaginable. And you all can do the same thing. And you have a choice to be the change agent or watch the change happen. Um, Mayor, uh, message sent, message received. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, uh, DCBIA will certainly be there to support your initiatives and support the initiatives of the five-year economic development initiative. Um, I'm going to bring Deborah here, but since the mayor's time is so valuable, we have him for just a short, short period of time. Um, you and uh, Congressman Issa had had some preliminary conversations about just exploring having a conversation about the 1910 Hyde Act. Uh, that is of great interest to this development community. Can you share some of your thoughts about the 1910 Hyde Act? Well, yeah, there'll be lots of pain to change that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, what we've been working on is fairly meager, in my opinion. Um, it, it really is an effort to take, uh, many of you all know, to take the uh, mechanical penthouses which now are, you, you can exceed the Hyde Act with those, but only for those purposes. Uh, this would allow the District of Columbia to use that as living space, which essentially would add another floor. Uh, uh, when I say living space, I mean for residences as well as office space in the city, which certainly would expand the economy uh, in the city. Um, there's also been discussion about maybe doing it outside the L'Enfant area uh, in the city, which would be easier uh, to accomplish. Um, but we've already seen lots of opposition, uh, even to this very small change of using the mechanical penthouses uh, for purposes of growing, uh, you know, of growing the uh, capacity in the city. And you can imagine what some of the concerns are that, well, this is the camel's nose under the tent, right? That once you start that, there's no end to this that will look like New York City where the buildings are so tall that the sun never shines <clears throat> on some streets. I can tell you that that's not the intent, <clears throat> but I can also understand uh, people's angst uh, about the possibility of that happening. So I think if we get this one change uh, made, which I think there's some, some momentum to do that, I think it will start a further conversation about should we give further latitude to uh, the air rights you know, uh, in, in the District of Columbia or the airspace that's available 
By the way, in that regard, we are, I think, pretty close to finishing after floundering for 20 years, I-395. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. That, that development, that's, that's a 2.2 billion square feet 2.2 million square feet, billion, boy, that'd be big, wouldn't it? <laughs> 2.2 million square foot project that will that will start to use the space up, you know, that ugly area up uh, the tunnel, Third Street Tunnel and, and the like. Uh, we hope to be able to finalize that in the near future, which again, is not exactly the Height Act, but it certainly will begin to use air in, in a little more creative way than we've used in the past. Uh, Mayor, I will tell you from DCBI's perspective, uh, we are aligned with our thoughts about the Height Act, that to take mechanical structures and being able to use them for human occupancy, swimming pools, conference centers, the like, and so mm -hmm. we, we'd like to work with you on that. Uh, let me bring in Deborah Ratner Salzberg, who has a number of very large scale, complicated projects within the city. Um, Debbie, can you share with us what this strategy means for you in your consideration of deploying finite resources to a number of projects in the city, um, things including the Height Act, and, and, and I know that you're quite an advocate for housing, and there's a large housing component of uh, the yards, but how do you think this strategy bolsters the city in incenting development companies to look at the district? Very, very exciting. It's interesting to me because I spend a fair amount of time thinking about where do we allocate our resources. And to be perfectly frank, over the past 24 months, we've spent a fair amount of time saying we love the district, our heart is in the district, but we need to be looking more in Virginia. And, and the reason we did think we needed to be looking more in Virginia was because of the things that you, you are now addressing in this plan. Because we're looking at the difference in tax rates. And that is key. We are looking at the difference in regulations and streamlining regulations, and that is key. And it will make us more competitive. And when you look at what's happening with the federal government and what will then impact law firms, it is key, as you recognize in this report, that we have to diversify our economy. And you, you've put your finger on all of those things, you've identified them as things that we need to work on, and it will only enhance our ability to grow in the District of Columbia. So it's very exciting. Everything that you've mentioned, whether it's expands, you know, expanding the dedicated business development team. I mean, we need to do that. We're doing a great job now, and we're focusing on it. But I used to sit there and say two years ago, you know, Virginia's out there, and Maryland are out there, and they're really, they really have a concerted effort, and we don't have anybody focused on it. And now we do, and not only do we have one person, we have a whole team, and we really are focusing on that, which is terrific the height restriction, streamlining the regulatory process, talking about the ambassador program. The ambassador program at DCRA is phenomenal. I have been very fortunate in that I have a very large scale project. It came on strong during the recession and everybody wanted to help us get it done. So I really didn't realize how hard it was to get a building permit in the District of Columbia and what one had to go through because I got so much help. Well, life's different now. There are a lot of people building. And when I go out <laughs> and try to get a permit for one little building now, and I mean That's little, um, it, it's not so easy. And I see what the real world is like. So the fact that there will be these ambassador programs, you know, at and they will expand to DDOT and to DDOE and, and DC Water will be incredibly helpful to all of us doing business in the District of Columbia. Um, I looked at the fact, you know, we talk about it, but now it's in writing that we have to partner with the, you know, the office of the chief financial officer to look at TIF financing and, and what is out there and, and actually maybe talk a little bit about the cap and what's counted against it because that will help us with economic development. And, you know, you, you don't have to go any further than the Capitol Riverfront to understand what TIF and what all of these financing mechanisms can do to develop neighborhoods. And they really are terrific tools, and we need the ability to continue to use them to grow, particularly in emerging markets. Uh, so as I said, we mentioned the real estate rate. We're talking about retail leakage. I mean, you've hit all of the hot buttons that are important to us, I think, in the real estate community. And I know we're not talking about housing, but I have to say that, and there are a group of people, I think there are a handful of people who work with me on the housing task force. We talk about supply and demand, and we say we cannot meet the, the, the needs for housing in the District of Columbia solely through additional supply. We need to hit the demand side, and that means we need to get people jobs. If we are going to be able to address housing in the district, particularly for low-income people earning below 30% of median income, they need jobs. And to me, 
both from a professional side, what I do operationally, but also from a social justice side. This is a very exciting plan. So thank you for all the work you've all put in on it. Let, let me um, ask the deputy mayor this question, but I'll put it in the context of this. One of the early lessons that I learned from Dr. Jarvis is to count your votes, right? <laughs> Make sure you have seven votes on the council. Um, Deputy Mayor, how can you use the economic impact model that the Dean has created for things like the tech initiative, the zero capital gains? Mm -hmm. and, and, and I would imagine that a lot of this strategy requires council approval. Mm -hmm. So how we were disappointed in the business community that the council didn't pass the zero cap gains legislation last time, but how can you use that economic impact model to help shape policy? Mm -hmm. Well, 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 first of all, you need to know that it, <clears throat> economic impact models are used by some economic development agencies around the country. They started using them um, back in the, in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, when I was in Maryland, we created um, an economic impact model. It was in the mid-90s. Um, to basically um, really focus on resource allocation. This is a little different than your normal economic impact model. This really speaks to resource allocation. It's, it's like, um, it, uh, you know, and I'm sure, I'm sure Deborah does this all the time. Do I invest in Capital Riverfront or do I invest in Virginia? What, what am I, same money, what, am, what are my returns? I mean, that's really, that's really the question. That's essentially what this, this model does. And, 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 and I was involved, I actually co-created this model with, uh, with an individual uh, from Maryland, an economist from Maryland for the state of Maryland. But well, we've done a similar model, and this is actually um, the District of Columbia's model. Um, and we have um, allowed the, the, um, the, the, uh, the dean and, his, and, and students there to actually use it to do the analysis. So it's ours. It's ours to use. It's, it's our assumptions. It's, it's, it's our approach. Um, now, in these analytics um, are, are, many, are many factors. Uh, Capital gains is just one. It, it, it is really looking at what is my investment, where it's going, how can I get the highest return? Um, and that speaks to uses, that speaks to market opportunity, that speaks to a, a lot of different issues. So it's just, that would just be one element. And it, 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 it certainly could um, you know, help quite a bit in terms of the, the argument. But just on the, on the basis of a, a competitive environment, even, even without the analytics, I think the mayor, and the mayor has made this point before, and I think it's, and it's a very good point, which is, you know, um, if these people, if people don't locate here and they move to another place, that's zero. We, you know, you know, and, and, and you know, 9%, 8.75% or 8.95% of, of nothing is nothing. And, and so there, there's a basic, and, and, and I think it speaks to, sometimes you don't have to do analytics. Sometimes you just need to take the time to explain um, from a different perspective. Now, we went in, we spoke from our perspective, from the government perspective. What we really needed, and the mayor spoke to this, was the, the private sector. I'm going to give you one example that was hugely effective, Uber. Do you guys remember when Uber was trying to get their, that legislation through? I was walking down the hall one day, and I heard a councilman, and he was like screaming at the top of his lungs, I got 5,000 emails from uh, text messages from those people from Uber. What the heck is Uber? Well, you know, when that was all over, it was very clear to him what Uber was and how he should vote. And you know what? I'm sure they used some little app to do this. Um, can't we get that clever? I mean, you know, I mean, can you imagine if all of you guys used an app to speak your voice on, on the 3%? I think that's way more powerful than all the analytics we could ever do because sometimes you can't convince with numbers. Sometimes the numbers have to be numbers of people, not, not data numbers. So, so I'm just trying to you know, get some clarity on, on that one in particular. But on deals themselves, what we invest in, it is a tremendous um, instrument in terms of how we select and do deals, how we focus on deals, and how we decide on which deals to do. The mayor mentioned more resources. We will have more human resources, but it's only because we will be doing more projects. Um, we have currently discussed, and I think Jeff Miller, our director of real estate, is back over in that, that part of the room right there. You might want to talk to him afterwards. Uh, the mayor has uh, approved for us to, um, to now um, look at um, somewhere between 30 and 35 additional deals uh, to be rolled out over the next 12 to 18 months. Um, you know, this is a lot of work. But you know what? It creates a lot of opportunity for the people in this room. Um, I don't know how many of you attended the July 27th uh, rollout event. Um, we had about 700 people attend this event at Lincoln Theater, where we rolled out nine RFPs that we did this past fall. And actually, we still have three or four of them coming out. We're going to do the same thing in the spring. 
um, right around the beginning of April. We're going to do it again. We want you to have a pre-look. We want you to see these deals coming. We don't want you scrambling it at the last minute. You guys have, you have important investment decisions. When I, when I was on the private side in private equity, all I thought about was how do I strategically place capital to get my return so that my exit matches the returns that I've promised my investors? You guys make those decisions every day. All I thought about is how do I reduce risk so that I have some certainty going forward? That's what we're trying to do for you. Reduce your risk, give you certainty, help you anticipate, um, and, and those things will help drive your returns. So uh, our goal is really to, to, to use these models and to use you know um, the the little apps and things like that, to, to make sure that we move in the right direction. So. All right, let me ask the mayor and deputy mayor one more question. We'll go to the dean, and I'd like to open up questions to our, our body. Uh, we have a very robust CBE and LSDBE community in the district. Um, if I were a CBE or LSDBE, what, what, what benefits would uh, the strategy bring to that community? Well, maybe I'm going to ask Victor to talk about the uh, legislation that we just uh, transmitted. We've been working now for several months on um, trying to reform uh, how CBEs get the opportunity to do business in the District of Columbia. Um, what we have tried to do, frankly, uh, with this legislation is to try to make sure that a District of Columbia CBE is, in fact, a District of Columbia CBE. Uh, isn't that creative? Uh, isn't that innovative? Um, I had a situation recently where somebody came up to me and, um, and said, some of you may have heard me tell this story, that the person said, I don't understand why I can't get certified as a, as a you know, CBE in the District of Columbia. I said, well, I, I don't know. Tell me what the problem is. He said, well, I've tried, and I can't get through the system. I said, well, I'm really sorry. I said, we're working on you know, legislative reform and whatnot. And he said, so I said, where are you? Where are you located? He said, I'm in Ward 8. I said, okay, well, where in Ward 8 are you? He says, I'm in Ward 8. I said, no, where specifically in Ward 8 are you? He says, well, I'm not quite in Ward 8 yet. I'm in Maryland right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, you know what? Let me, let, me be as a, let me be as blunt as I possibly can. I will do nothing to try to have Maryland, Virginia, or any other state CBEs become certified in the District of Columbia because we want people who are in the District of Columbia to do business in the District of Columbia. Isn't that a radical idea? Uh, I said, when you, when, you, when you move into the District of Columbia and you have your principal you know, place of business in the District of Columbia, then you come back and see us at that stage. So frankly, one of the things I think we can do is to make sure that we have legitimate CBEs in the District of Columbia whose address in the District of Columbia is not a post office box. It is not some front. Uh, we've seen problems with JVs. We hope that this legislation that we have advanced will clear the way uh, for CBEs to be able to more easily do business legitimately in the District of Columbia. Uh, the legislation that I think is sub, I don't know when the hearing is, but there's a hearing coming up because we hope to work with the council to get this moved through before this legislative uh, session ends uh, at the end of December. And so at the risk of being, and this will throw me back, being a broken record, <laughs> how about a uh, flawed CD? <laughs> uh, might I suggest that you all testify uh, at this hearing? And uh, hopefully you'll support the concepts that are contained in there. If there are ways in which we can improve it, then you know, say so. But if you don't show up, if you don't participate, the assumption is that you don't care and that you're not a force. And I can tell you, I, I can tell you from having been in the advocacy community, having been a council member uh, for, uh, uh, you know, for two years as the Ward 7 member and then four years as the, cha the chair, whether you like it or not, that is the assumption. And if you don't show up, the assumption is you don't exist uh, from the perspective of making the case. So I think the best thing we can do right now for CBEs is to make sure that there is legitimacy to the CBEs that want to do business in the District of Columbia that joint ventures, for example, truly are legitimate joint ventures in the first place. And we think that this legislation uh, accomplishes much of that uh, as we move forward. Great. The mayor covered um, um, you know, almost everything to a T. There's, there's one other part I'd, I'd like to mention, um, which has to do with implementation. We currently only have, I think, one person monitoring over 1,100 companies in the city. Um, I don't know about you guys, but 
you know, it's difficult for me to make a thousand phone calls in a year, okay? So um, this is actually physically calling on and going through the records of an agency, of an organization to check whether or not it's a CBE. The mayor has had this experience. I have had this experience. Somebody actually came into my office with a business card that had an address um, on it that was in Ward 8 and then told me that their business was really located in Maryland. So it, it, it's just Probably a... the same guy. Well, <laughs> it's just astounding. And he had the same problem. I can't get nerve certified in the District of Columbia. So, so we really need to get the manpower out there. And the mayor has set aside um, enough funding for nine additional slots, which would break it down to about 70 to 80 uh, companies per person, which is actually a realistic, you can do two or three visits a year and actually check and see if anything's changed. And you know all the things that we say that we are supposed to do in the legislation. So the manpower will be behind what the mayor is talking about. Uh, thank you. Um, Dean Guthrie, let me ask you, as the technology sector in the district starts to blossom, what does a urban campus look like uh, in the district? And it, it, do the universities have the ability to leverage their occupancy and their presence to kind of spark uh, economic development, especially in some of the emerging neighborhoods? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that's so exciting about this plan and this, this moment in time for the, the district is really the opportunity to have a deep engagement across these sectoral lines. And so we really view ourselves today as not just the place where education is happening, but as, as an institution that is, again, a, a citizen of this, uh, of this city and, and can contribute in a number of different ways. Before I answer your question specifically about sure. D.C., I should say that, the, for me, the most inspirational economic development story, and having studied some of this over, over the years, um, was the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, it was decimated from its loss of jobs in steel uh, in, the, in the 70s. And in the early 80s, they looked around and they said, well, how are we actually going to reconstruct jobs in this city? Uh, and they said, well, we have two great universities. One of them has, is the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, is the largest employer in the entire city. Um, and the other happens to be really good in technical engineering, right? So how do we actually bring these two things together, not just to create do jobs for doctors or people in, the, in the, uh, the high end professional services, but how do we rebuild an economy? And from that came an economic development strategy that was really about the development of medical instruments industry that is all a part of the ancillary industry around it. So it doesn't, didn't just create professional services jobs, but it created skilled labor jobs that actually put people back to work. So if you translate that to what we're trying to, to be a part of in this economic development story as well, um, we really see the opportunity not just for us to be educating people, but for us to actually really be engaged with these kind of creative economic spillover effects. So you take, for example, what's happening uh, with Microsoft coming into, into Ward 8 in St. Elizabeth. I would love to see our university, together with Georgetown, together with American mm -hmm. and Howard, be a part of a, a tech, high-tech incubator that is actually using the, the leverage of what we need to do in terms of job creation, or in, in terms of education, to really translate into job creation for the technology sector. You see this kind of thing happen in places like Stanford, uh, and we would really love to be that for the city. Now, my own university is, this is sort of a sweet spot for where we're going because we're in the process of building a, a 500,000 plus square feet building that is going to be a very innovative place in, in science and engineering. Um, and uh, it's right over there on, on uh, 22nd and, and H Street. And it's going to be innovative because it's actually going to be one of the few places where science and engineers are going to sit together. Usually they're kind of balkanized in different schools, but this is actually going to be a place where the hard science and bench scientists are going to be sitting with the engineers and they're going to be thinking about creative innovation. So why not just take one step further and say, how are we going to actually be a part of working together with the city and Microsoft and CityLoom and all of the other organizations that, that, uh, that are key to economic development? As a business school dean, this gets me excited as well because teaching business is a great thing to do, but here again, you have to really reach out to the other technical sciences to really see where, where the economic development opportunities are. Uh, it always chagrins me because we have a business plan competition every year and it's the engineers who win every time. It pisses me off. But, but, but that tells you the story, right? So, uh, so, so that's just one of many examples. We could see a similar kind of example. Uh, you know, we were, the deputy mayor and I were at, at an, uh, an, an event that, that the business school helped as sort of a consulting project for the Sheikh Zayed Center up near McMillan. 
uh, because Children's Hospital is the pediatric group, group that operates with the, the GW um, Medical Faculty Associates. And the opportunities there to build a, a medical hub that is innovative and powerful, you know, the universities are going to have to be a part of that, and we're just thrilled with the possibility of being a part of it. You know, if I could just add uh, to one of the, the uh, several important, important points that Dean Guthrie made, um, when you look at what's going on, um, what, what we plan to go on at St. Elizabeth's, um, this is where you start to connect the dots. Uh, we are, some of you have seen the uh, animated uh, video of what we're planning to do with Baloo High School. Uh, we're investing $120 million in building a new high school, and a concentration there will be STEM. Uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. We're creating a presence at St. Elizabeth's, hopefully, uh, well, I'm going to say hopefully we're going to, uh, of technology, a concentration. And what a great opportunity will be for those students who are attending Baloo High School. Baloo will be the second largest high school in the city. Uh, right now, Woodrow Wilson is this, the, uh, the largest with 1,600 students enrolled. Baloo will have 1,400 students enrolled. These are kids who are talented, but they haven't had the kinds of opportunities in the past that they will have now. So it isn't just a wonderful building that they will be able to walk into. And by the way, this school will be finished in July of 2014, which means in 22, 23 months, or whatever the, the math is, they will be in a brand new high school. But they will be able to see right up the street opportunities that will be available to them at various levels, coming out of high school, going on to a community college that we hope to make more robust, or going on to, uh, you know, to further uh, efforts, you know, uh, uh, university level uh, efforts. That's also, as you look at school consolidation, that's what, what's going on. That's what we intend to do with Spingarn High School. Spingarn is being closed only for a short period of time. It is being converted into a technology, uh, a technical high school, let me put it that way. Um, it, will, it will train young people um, in being able to work in, tra in er the various areas of transportation. Uh, we are planning to put a streetcar barn on the grounds of uh, Spingarn High School, and young people will be able to be trained in that high school for those jobs that will increase substantially uh, in the years ahead. Those will be high-paying jobs that in some instances won't require much more than a, uh, a high school education. Uh, but they will be specifically trained for those, or, or a two-year degree or a four-year degree. And it's beginning to connect the dots between what education means in the District of Columbia and what are the job opportunities that are being created and expanded uh, that will connect with those educational opportunities. Thank you, Mayor. I would just yes. like to add, looking at it from the outside, it is very refreshing to see the interaction between the D.C. government and the, edu the, the higher education community. I mean, oftentimes the higher education community has been looked at not, not as a partner, but as somebody who doesn't really contribute to the District of Columbia in terms of the tax base. And we forget that they are the third largest employers in the district, and people shop, people eat, people live in the District of Columbia. But more importantly, they offer a tremendous commitment to the District of Columbia and an ability, as we can see from this report, to work with us and enhance where we are going in the district. So I, I think this in, in and of itself is tremendously refreshing and wonderful to see that, you know, that the government is working this closely with the institutions of higher education. You know, Debbie, I was smiling because um, when I was, when I was get, get, about the time I was getting started uh, 22 months ago in this job, Somebody said, why don't you tax the universities? They got all this land that, you know, is, is, is tax exempt, um, and they're increasing their presence in the city. What a great way to raise revenue for the city. You know, and, and, in, and in a nice way, I said, that's ridiculous. <laughs> uh, I said, why would we do something like that? I said, the potential relationship with the universities will yield far more than the animosity and whatever uh, you know, dollars are generated from taxing uh, universities. And I, there is no way I would do that. Be, and, and for the very reasons you talked about, and that is the potential um, deriving from the relationship between the city and the universities is far beyond what you could ever generate in whatever tax, property tax dollars um, that would, be, would, would emerge from that, let alone the, the ill will that would be generated from it uh, as well. So. Just 
reinforcing your point. Let me uh, open it up for a few questions. If you have a question for any of our panelists, uh, may I ask that you uh, stand and um, give your name and your company name? Questions? Well, that certainly reflects the depth of the conversation we had. And, and I, will, I will tell you, Mayor, it is now uh, uh, 10, 10 nearly. And typically, this audience has are involved in deals and transactions, and they would have gone by now. But I, I tell you, this economic development strategy is so important to the real estate and construction community. I'm so happy to see that everybody's still here. I saw one question. You just um, articulated um, that and most people in here are probably not familiar with the 108 program. The only reason I am is when I was Deputy Commissioner of Housing and Community Development for the City of Baltimore, um, we used it quite a bit. Um, and there are a lot of jurisdictions around the country that do. The interesting thing is that you know, it depends a lot on how much you spend. And if you're spending your cash flow out, you can't use that cash flow to guarantee um, the loan. And that's, that's really the, the city has... Right, through the through CDBG allocation. Yeah. We should probably sit down with you um, and uh, my director of housing and community development, Michael Kelly, and, and talk about how we could use that program. Just that, I mean, the question was um, that there's, there have been a quite a few plans for uh, New York Avenue uh, coming into the District of Columbia, and, and Daryl was asking whether or not uh, the city had any plans uh, along that alignment. Um, as you probably know, most of that is owned privately, um, and where we've been able to do, um, actually working with HUD um, and, and others, we've been able to, um, after 28 years, actually, the mayor, after 22 months, um, has almost completed the first, um, you know, uh, Costco in the history of the city that will be located there. That shopping center had been in the planning stages. I, I saw some plans that were dated, you know, quite a while ago. But let's say that um, it is it is very difficult because most of it's privately owned. That was a redevelopment site. We had some influence. Um, so where we have influence, we will exercise that. We're talking to private developers along there. Um, Doug Jamal, um, you know Rick Walker. Um, they have sites that are planned right now. Um, but as you know, you, you know you involved in this process. It's um, these deals are hard to do. Um, a lot of them depend very much on your tenant mix um, and can you sign the tenant up. So that's all about the cash flow and all about the net operating income. And I know everybody in here is sensitive to all of that. So. That has really been the difficult part, is really um, them getting a good tenant mix that works. Um, uh, um, 
Michelle Hagens has done a tremendous job uh, with her project in terms of uh, residential as, as, and as well as the shopping center, and she's been a great partner um, with, with, um, with DEMPED and with the mayor. Um, and we just need more partners like that that are flexible in terms of their approach. Because sometimes you get a developer, and not, not that there are any in this room like that, but developers that have perspectives that actually run counter to what the opportunity is. Um, and what we try to do is we try to match the opportunity with our resources. And, um, that's happening. It's just a, it's just a slow process, especially when things have been in play for thirty, you know, twenty, thirty years. So, you know, uh, since since Victor mentioned uh, the Dakota project and Costco, think about it from the perspective to a retail leakage. Uh, how much money, you know, because that's right on the perimeter uh, of the city, and that's what we want to do more of also. And that is. Uh, that Costco is going to attract people in the city who, who uh, you know, normally go to a Costco somewhere else because we don't have one uh, in the city. Uh, it will open, by the way, on November 29th uh, in just a matter of a couple of weeks. But think about the people, not only retail leakage, but retail attraction, for want of a better way of putting it, and that is people who live in Maryland who will stop there coming into the city or going out of the city who normally now don't spend anything uh, in the city. So. This is also an opportunity for us with this, this kind of strategy to become more competitive for business, not only the business that lives in the District of Columbia, but the business that comes into the city every day. We're going to have to wrap up the program now, but I just want to thank our panelists, and I want to thank the, the mayor and the deputy mayor. This is a game changer for our industry. And, and so this is the playbook in which the mayor, the deputy mayor, the dean, and the private sector are going to run. And, and so it's up to the private sector to partner with our public sector partners to execute this. But this is, you know, at the end of five years, we, we will all reconvene and, and, and talk about how do we amend this going forward. So this is a game changer. I want to thank the mayor um, for his leadership in our city. Uh, he gets business, which is, which is wonderful. So <laughs> thank, thank, thank you to our panelists and thank you to our audience for coming.